cool. Let's pray tonight. And uh, we're, I, I got like a, we're in First John, but I got like a word tonight. So I got a preacher mic, but I'm not going to preach. I just don't feel like wearing a headset. All right, cool. Let's pray. God, thank you for the opportunity to open your word in the middle of the week. Thank you for those who um, take time out of their weeks to come and sit here and listen. For those who listen online and watch on live stream and just say, I want more of God in my life. I just pray, God, that uh, your word says, if we seek you, we will find you. If we seek you with all of our heart. And so I just pray tonight that we would press into you, that we would seek you, and that we would find you tonight as we seek you. And I thank you for your word in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So if you guys want to grab your Bibles tonight, we've been in First John. It feels like forever. It's been since like March. And we're still there. It's, it is a good book, isn't it? It's, it's a, uh, I'm learning a lot as I'm studying it, and I have to say I am enjoying studying it. And what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to read some of the same verses that TJ started out with last week, but then I'm going to kind of trail off into Romans a little bit, because as I was preparing this afternoon and praying here at noon, I felt like I wanted to go a little bit different. So look at John, 1 John chapter 2. Starting in verse 15, it says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the creatings of sinful men, the lust of the eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does, comes from comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. And so last week, TJ kind of touched on this a little bit at the beginning. I know you guys went into more discussion time, but the idea behind what John is saying right here in this passage is this idea that we're not supposed to love the world, which always is hard for me because I'm like, but aren't we called as a church to love everyone, to welcome people, and to go that Jesus died for God so loved the world, right? And so when you start digging into it and you go back to the original Greek, what was written here, and, um, it, it becomes a little bit bigger picture of what he's talking about, about the world. And that's kind of what I want to talk about tonight. And so if you want to go over to the book of John, chapter 12, and look at verse 25. It's just a simple verse. And then we're going to go over to Romans and spend some time there tonight. John chapter 12. It's a basic verse, and it just says, He who loves his life will lose it. Pretty basic, right? He who loves his life will lose it. What John is talking about both in 1 John and in the book of John is this idea that if we love the world more than we love God, we miss the point. And the world that he's talking about is not souls of individual people who were called to go and reach, but he's talking about the pattern of the world we live in and the system of the world that we live in. A, commentary, a commentator writes about John chapter 12, verse 25, and he says, the reading here is uncertain, which is interesting because I read this and I'm a little bit confused, so even the commentators are confused. He says it's uncertain and maybe perhaps with slightly more probability that Uh, is that he who loves his life will lose it, i.e. that the loss of life is not in the future only, but that in the present, in every moment when a man loves and seeks to save his own life, he is then, by the very seeking, actually losing it. The words of this verse are familiar to us from the early Gospels, and they've been explained uh, in Matthew and in Mark and in Luke. The disciples heard them and laid down, or laid them down as the law of their own life and work. They now hear these mysterious words again, he who loves his life will lose it. And as I started to study that this afternoon, and I'm in 1 John, and I'm saying, don't love the world, it just, there's something in me that was like, okay, God, what are you trying to say? And I couldn't get away from this. So turn over to Romans chapter 12, and look at Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 1, because when you start digging in, and I'm going to read you some things out of a commentary in a minute here before we get into uh, too much of it. When you start digging in, it starts, God starts to reveal what he's trying to get us to in this point. And I felt like today this is what God would have for us to pray through tonight. So I'm going to try not to preach too long so we can spend some time praying. But there's no promises. Therefore, Romans 12, 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy 
and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. This commentator that I was studying this afternoon writes about John chapter 12, uh, starting in, in verse 2, talking about not being conformed to the world, but being transformed. And he says in here, let's see here, I want to make sure I get this right. I had occasion to point out in a sermon on the preceding verse, which talks about our, leaving our bodies as, sacrifice, holy, or as uh, sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. He saw a, a preaching about that verse, that the apostle is in this context making the transition from the doctrinal to the practical part of his letter. And that he lays down the broad principles of which all his subsequent injunctions and exhortations. Sorry, I got it back here. Oh, no. Where did it go? Hold on a second. Where did uh, the next page didn't print? Well, it was really good. Oh, I hate when that happens. Okay, well, we'll just keep on going here. All right, so basically he goes on. I'll terrify what he's saying. It's basically when the writer's writing this, it's that the writer of Romans is going from this place that was very theological. If you go through Romans 1 through 12, it's a lot. It's deep. It's, it's rooted. It's the, I don't know what I do. And so when I don't do it, I sin, and all the, I do not do what I want to do, and all these things I want to do. And what Paul is getting to at this context is the idea that I've talked about all this stuff. I, I've told you all these things, which basically is lay your life down for Christ. Don't live for yourself. Don't love yourself more than you love God. Don't love the world more than you love God. Now I'm going to make it very practical. And so he goes into verse 2, and he says, do not be conformed. Here the English is somewhat misleading, it would naturally lead us to expect a similar play on the words in Greek, but it is not. Indeed, there's a clear distinction between the two words here. It is the difference between an outward conformity or a disguise and a thorough inward assimilation. The Christian is not to copy the fleeting fashions of the present time, but to be wholly transfigured in view of that higher mode of existence in strict accordance with God's will that he has chosen. And so what this commentator is saying is that when Paul is saying to us, do not conform to the pattern of the world, just like John is saying, do not love the world, that what he's not talking about is this exterior world that we're looking at and judging everyone around us going, well, I can't love you because you don't look like me, talk like me, act like me, right? But it's this internal desire that we have called our flesh that wants to drive our life to love ourselves and love the world of the world that we live in internally greater than we love God. He goes on and he says the world here, when he's talking about, was talking about the world that existed at the coming of Christ and uh, as opposed to the newly inaugurated Masonic reign. So basically when Paul's writing, he's talking about the world state when Jesus came in the first time and not when he comes back to reign as Messiah. To be conformed to this world is to act as the world acts, those who don't know God, in opposition to what this apostle exhorts his readers is to undergo that a total change will bring them more into accordance with the will of God. What he's saying here is the only way that you can come into accordance with God's will is by not conforming to the world, and the world is bowing down to that internal flesh inside of you that says, I will choose what I want, what I like, what I desire over loving God. Now, I don't know about you guys, but to me, when I was studying this this afternoon, something to me was like, oh, because when I think about the verses that say, do not love your life or do not love this world, I oftentimes have used it as an excuse, Right? Well, I just can't love the world, so, oh, well, they're just all going to die and go to hell, and ain't my problem, right? Like, just, okay, I'm just joking. But, uh, but you know, like, like we, we, there's, this, there's this thing in us that I'm like, well, that the whole gospel was he came to set us free and to preach. He says, go into all the world. Why would he then tell us not to love the world? Because what he's talking about is this pattern inside of us that continually desires our flesh over him. And so tonight what I want to say to us as we 
as like, if you want to take some notes on the things tonight, I want to talk through because this is what I felt like God was leading me to this afternoon when I was over here praying. I was up on the balcony praying and I was working on the notes for this message tonight. And I felt again like this, um, I hate, I hate, I don't know, I hate to use the word, but I think it's like a stronghold, like something needs to be broken. And I was like, God, what is that? Like, what do we, like, why do I keep coming back to this feeling like we need to break something? Like, you know, like what, like what's holding us back? And as I started studying this more than later this afternoon, I felt like what God said is you need to talk about patterns. Because he says not to conform to the pattern of this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. He says, if you love your life, you will lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake, you will find it. He says not to love the world or anything in the world, which is pretty much saying to us, we need to figure out what is this world he's talking about. We know it's internal. We know it's the flesh. We know in 1 John, he says it's the loss of the flesh, the loss of the eyes, and the pride of life. Those are like some three pretty like hard things, right? Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. But then in Romans 12, he says, so don't even conform to the patterns that are leading this world that you live in. So I wrote this down this afternoon that if you are in a place where your prayers are not powerful, can I suggest that you look at the patterns you're pursuing? It's a lot of peas. I like pastors use peas. I don't know. If your prayers are not powerful, can I suggest that you look at the patterns that you're pursuing? Because the only way that we can learn to be transformed by the renewing of our mind and to live a sacrificial life that Romans 12 is talking about is if we learn to identify the patterns that we are prone to live in. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over, expecting different results. Anybody ever feel insane? Over and over, and you're like, dear Lord, can I please just get breakthrough in this issue? I've prayed over this thing over and over and over, and nothing is changing. And so how do we identify the patterns in our life that we've, we, we've learned that this world that we live in is obviously we live in a physical world, but there's this internal fight of our flesh trying to win against our love for God and our love for humanity. How do we identify the patterns that we have to come to in our lives? What are the patterns in our life? Where are the places that we're doing over and over and over and we keep falling back into temptation? I was thinking about Sunday again, and we keep going back to this over and over a couple weeks ago, but that idea of the pattern in James where if you're tempted and temptation leads to desire and desire leads to sin and sin leads to death, that in itself is a pattern. If you're given to temptation, you'll get to desire. If you're given to desire, you'll get to sin. You get to sin, you'll die. Right? Like, that's pretty gruesome, but it's the truth. It's a pattern. And the Bible over and over works in patterns. I was reading this afternoon in Genesis 27 about Jacob. Jacob's one of those guys in the Old Testament. You can turn there if you want. I'm not going to read much of it. I'm just telling more of the story. But Jacob, if you watch the pattern of Jacob's life over and over, he had this pattern of deceit in his life where he lied to his brother to steal his birthright. And then lied to his father to get the generational blessing put on his house. And it was this perpetual pattern where he was trying to get God's blessing, but he was going about it through deceit. And what God did bless him because thank God that his grace is sufficient for everything we do wrong. But he he, he still did get blessed in his life, but it didn't come easily. When he went to marry the love of his life, his father in law followed the same pattern and lied to him. And ended up having to work seven more years for the wife he actually wanted. And then so 14 years for the woman he was supposed to work seven years for. Why? Because he had this pattern of deceit in his life. And I just wonder if maybe he had been listening to, I mean, you could argue because the Holy Spirit like came in the New Testament, I understand that. But the Spirit of God was hovering over the earth in the Old Testament. So if he was listening to God, right, the very first time he deceived his brother for his birthright, Could he have broke that pattern? And could the fact that Esau got the generational blessing still not hinder the blessing God had on Jacob's life? He wouldn't have to lie his way in. And would he have just had Rachel and not had all the baggage of he going through Genesis of the generation, the 12 tribes of Israel and all the drama, which God used it all to reconcile and build it up. But what I'm saying is the pattern that he constantly had over and over was this pattern of deceit. You look at the life 
of David. And it's David is an interesting one to look at because you don't see a whole lot of pattern in his life. There's a, definitely a pattern of passionate, right? And sometimes passionate can be good and sometimes passionate cannot be good. His passion drove him to what we talked about Sunday, to go kill a man to sleep with his wife, right? His passion drove him to do things that he probably should not have done. And, but a lot of the, the if, you, if you look at David's life as a whole, a lot of the issues he had came down to this passion, desire overtaking and leading to sin, especially around women. Well, the next generation, because patterns that we have can transfer on to the next generation if we don't get them broken, right? The next generation, Solomon comes up, and he doesn't just have, like his dad, a couple issues with women. This guy ends up with 300 wives and 700 concubines because he's got this perpetual pattern that's been in their family over and over because they haven't dealt with the pattern. So my question for us tonight as we prepare to go into prayer in a few minutes is as you're searching your own heart and you know, okay, I can't love the world. I can't love my flesh more than I love God. I can't pursue what I want to live in more than I want what, what God has for my life. What can I look at in my life and say, these are patterns that I need to have broken and maybe this is why this is happening right now in my life, right? I was thinking about this for myself today and different things and different goals that I set for myself and why don't I achieve those goals? Why, why if I have this idea, like not, it's not even always just sin issues, right? It's not, patterns don't just have to be like I'm in some deep, dark sin. Patterns can be laziness. Patterns can be a perpetual, like, um, the word just escaped my mind. Patterns can be this like perpetual, like, I'm going to do this thing, I'm going to do this thing, and then the enemy comes and says, you can't do that thing, and so you give up. Like over and over, I was telling our staff last night that I've had this desire for like four years. I started writing a book four years ago, and every time I try to write more of the book, I like literally, I wrote a whole chapter a couple weeks ago, and I was like, wow, I should do this. Like I've had this desire. I know God put it in there. I got the title. I got every, the whole book is outlined, but every time I sit down to try to write it, the enemy's like, who's going to read a book you wrote? Who are you? No, Grace will, thank you. But like, <laughs> one person. Okay, cool. But like, so I, and then I immediately give up. And if I look at that deeper rooted in my life, it's not about a book. It's not about the fact that I can or can't do it. There's a pattern in me that actually doesn't think that I deserve it or that I'll actually be able to do it. So I give up in it. And how many other things do I do the same thing in my life? How many times when I told you guys the story about removing these pews, did God have to beat me over the head before I'd be obedient? I'm like, God, that looks stupid. Like, Why would you tell me to remove some pews out of a church that, like, it just doesn't make sense. It's not going to, like, not to mention it's not going to match the carpet and I'm OCD and that's going to bother me. And God's like, because I told you to do it. And then you watch in this church the last couple of weeks what's happening, this altar's packed. Because finally God got through. But I think for me, it takes so long to break the patterns why? It goes back to because I've conformed to the pattern of this world, which says love yourself more than you love God. And love of self can so many times lead us to a place where we're like, well, it's not me loving myself because I don't even like the way I look. Love of self is not maybe liking the way you look as much as it's liking what other people think about you. Because the first Sunday there was some pews gone and I said it. Some people told me I was an idiot. And I love myself, right? <laughs> Dan Combs. No, I'm just, yeah. <laughs> but like there's, there's pieces to you that you're like, but I don't want to give up my ego or whatever. But that's a pattern that if I don't break, what then if God has something huge on the horizon and I'm like, oh, God, I don't know if I want to take that step because I'm afraid of it. And I'm at this point in my life when I was here praying today where I'm like, God, I want you to break every negative pattern in my life so I can hear your voice and do what you called me to do. So what are some patterns in our life. We need to identify the patterns that we're prone to live, just like Jacob and David have, just like Solomon. I think grumbling in a lot of the Old Testament, you look at the Israelites, was a pattern. We just want to get out of Egypt. So Moses comes and they get delivered out of Egypt. And oh no, now we're going to get killed by Egypt because we can't cross the Red Sea. So God parts the Red Sea and now they get through the Red Sea and all Pharaoh's army dies and it's like victory. And then they get down out in the desert and now they, 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 they can't, they, know they want food. So God gives them manna. Well, that's not good enough. So over and over and over to the point where they build a calf trying to worship a different God, all because of the pattern of grumbling. So what are the patterns in your life? Are they attitudes? reactions, unhealthy habits, mindsets of disbelief, sin. 
The next thing, if you're taking notes to write down, is that once you identify those patterns, according to Romans 12, 2, is that you then have to place your attention on Christ and not on your brokenness. 1 John 1, 9 says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us or purify us from all unrighteousness. We confess our patterns and we place our attention on Christ and not on our brokenness. Sometimes when we're trying to figure out why we're doing what we're doing, we try to get to the root of it, right? We try to figure out why did I make that mistake? Why did I go there? But the reality is that all of us have struggles. All of us fall short. All of us adapt and conform to the patterns of the world because we live in this world. But when we take our attention off the pattern and put our attention on Christ, we're walking by faith and not by sight. We're trusting in God's word and not in the patterns of our day. And so practically speaking, we learn to let faith guide us and not reality. If you look in the Old Testament at um, so many of the stories of people some of the, uh, I guess you would call prophets, and what they had to do, Jeremiah and Ezekiel and all the different prophets. If you read through the books of the prophets in the Old Testament, you can see this perpetual pattern in their life, but then you can see when God begins to change, when they change their mindset, which what is Romans 12 too, you have to have a renewing of your mind, then you'll be able to test and approve of what God's will is. And if you look at the life of Jeremiah, who starts out in Jeremiah 1 saying, woe is me, like, who am I, God? And then God calls him, and he's like, dude, before I knew you, and then because of that, Jeremiah's life was not perfect, but he surrendered to the will of God, not to the will of his flesh, and reached, for lack of better terms, or I guess wrote for a generation that still inspires us to this day. And so how we begin to break patterns is one, to identify them, but also then to place our attention on the pattern breaker, onto Christ. Instead of going to years and years of therapy, and I'm all for therapy. I've been to therapy. I like therapy. Like, instead of going, you know, trying to dig in deeper, why did I do this? Why did, where was all this from? Take our eyes off of why do I keep saying no, God, when you're asking me to do something, and put my eyes onto Christ and say, God, I want to trust you with my whole heart. And I don't want to think about the junk that I'm doing down here. I want to think about your goodness as I look to you. We have to believe that God really can change us. We have to believe that God really is our provider. And we have to believe that God is in control. We have to trust that no matter what we've been taught, no matter who told us it's not possible, that we serve a God of the impossible. And so we take our focus off of ourself, which goes back to Romans 12 where we started. He says, where's Romans 12? Hold on. I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper. One translation says this is your spiritual act of worship. What are we doing when we're taking our eyes off of ourselves and putting them on God? We're sacrificing, we're laying down our own flesh to say, I can't do this on my own. I have to put my trust in you and trust that you can break the patterns. This is the last one you can write down tonight. I told you I'm trying to keep it, look at it's only 724, I am keeping it short. This is good because I just felt like we need to pray tonight and I don't know what that means, but you all just need to pray. So um, turn over to Psalms chapter 16. Because the last one really is what we're going to do tonight. Ultimately, you could go through so many stories in the Bible. And you could pull out people like Jonah, who had a pattern of disobedience. And then when it turned to obedience, he began to go and reach a whole community for Christ or for God. You could go through so many different stories, but ultimately at the end of the day, instead of trying to figure out and go through and listen and all the things, what I felt like God said this afternoon is you just need to spend time in my presence. If you really want to see patterns broken in your life, you need to spend time in my presence. So Psalm chapter 
16 and verse 11, he says, you have made known to me the path of life. You fill me with joy in your presence with eternal pleasures at your right hand. The English Standard Version says, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. And at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, if you want to turn there, verses 17 and 18. Paul's writing here to the Corinthians, and he says, Now the Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. If we really want to see our lives changed, and we really want to see patterns broken in our lives, we have to spend time in his presence. We have to spend time at his feet. And what's so beautiful about seeking him and about being in his presence is that he says, if you spend time in my presence, you will have a fullness of joy forever. How crazy. What I think is still the contrast of joy when you look at a love of flesh, right? Do not, starting out with do not loving the things of this world. Joy fills you up. So if you're in a place where you're like, oh my goodness, like I'm having a really hard time giving up my flesh because if I give up my flesh, I feel like, I mean, I've been here. I, I feel like the, the whole, the whole play season last year of my life and watching the church that I started in my living room fall apart and trying to hold on to it like this, like, you are not taking it away. Like, you're not doing it. I don't care if seven people are only showing up on Sundays like they do on, on Tuesdays here, right? No, but like, but like you're not taking it away. Really what it came down to is I was afraid that if it went away, I would lose my joy because I found so much joy in what I had done because I was walking in what God had called me to do. But what he's saying here is, no, 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 you don't find joy in the things I've called you to do. That's good to do those things. But you find joy in my presence, which allows you to release your flesh, release the things that you're holding on to, release the patterns so you can find joy in my presence. His presence purifies our past. That's a lot of peace tonight. His presence purifies our past. His presence makes a way for the future. And his presence reminds us that there is so much more. There's more to life and more to God's presence to be found in him if we seek him. And it's way more than what our flesh desires. Jeremiah 29, you don't have to turn there. If you've been in church at all, you'd probably know it. If you want to turn there, Jeremiah 29, 11 through 14, but it says, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you a future and a hope. And then he goes into verse 12 through 14, and he says, call on me in your day of trouble and seek me, or if you seek me, you will find me, and I'll be found by you. And I think that sometimes we look at the first part of the verse and we're like, yeah, God's going to prosper us. And we get, we get stuck there and God's like, that's not the point. The point is prosperity is joy in my presence. It's wholeness. It's all of me in all of you. It's not about where you live or what you drive. It's about a relationship with me and the joy that you can have that will make you complete so you don't need to love the world you live in. Not the people, right? It's not about not loving the people. You don't need to love the flesh that you love so much, their inner self who's saying to yourself that you have to have it and you can't break it and you can't take it. But instead you seek me and you find in me everything you need and then my joy is made complete in you. And so what I want to close with tonight and just pray over you guys and then we got another half hour here to pray But I felt like this afternoon what God said we need to pray for tonight is to break bondage, to break patterns, and to break strongholds. And I think what's interesting right now, and I I just, I always keep it real, right? But I think what's interesting right now in our church is that I a lot lately have been sensing this stronghold word, and I hate it. I hate the stronghold word because it feels so, one, it feels churchy, but it also feels like, ugh. But all a stronghold is, is somewhere the enemy's got a grip on something or somebody, Right? 
And it seems so intimidating, like, oh no, there's a stronghold on my life. No, you have the power and the blood of Jesus Christ. Like, all you have to do is put his power, or put his blood on that thing, and, and pray the name of Jesus over it, and it breaks. And I think what I felt like God was reminding me today is that it's a continual thing that we have to constantly be in prayer against strongholds and bondage and patterns in our own life and in the lives of our church because as the church grows, as God continues to bless things, as things are starting to move where we were in a season six months ago where we're like, how are we gonna you know, keep going to now a season where God seems to be like putting his favor on our church and people are getting transformed and it's amazing. The more that's happening, the stronger the enemy's fighting And the harder it will be for us to keep our eyes on Christ and not on our bondage. And so I know that there's not a lot of us here tonight, but I felt like that was what God said for us to do tonight, was to pray against the strongholds, the patterns that we face, and the bondage that we face. Anything that is keeping us from knowing his will in our life, hearing his voice, or living in his best for us. That's what our instruction for tonight is. So I'm going to just pray, and if you want prayer for something, I'll stay up here and pray in the altar. Um, But but really what I felt like God said this afternoon when I wrote that down, it's about in his presence. So I don't know if it means we got to pray together or we just need to spend time in his presence. But I just want to encourage you guys tonight that whatever you need breaking in to ask someone to pray with you or I'll pray with you. But also then if you're like, I don't really have much in my life right now that I feel like, you know, sometimes you're in places of life where you don't feel like, like I've prayed a lot of that away already, Right? (laughs) But, like, I, I just want to ask you that if, if you're not in that place, then pray that for our church. Pray that as the enemy comes and tries to get people in a stronghold and tries to get them in a place where they're focusing on the pattern that's going on generation to generation. And it's like, well, grandma didn't have, you know, whatever, and I don't have it, and mama didn't have it, and that whole, like, around the mountain over and over. And then they show up in church, and they're like, I just don't know why nothing ever works in my life. Like, I've, I just felt today in my, in my spirit, like, like, and this is what I want, like, we all have junk all the time, right? I mean, this is not like, like, there's things we're always dealing with. But I think that there's something in the spirit realm that is happening where the enemy grabs people, especially those who may not know God hugely. I, I want to be careful. Anyways, you know what I mean? Like, if you're not solid, you don't have a solid foundation, and you haven't seen breakthrough in your life at any point and you don't know, then the minute the enemy comes and pushes you back towards your flesh, you don't think it's the devil because you think you're just looking out for you because you don't have the foundation of the word of God and the Holy Spirit. And so that's what I felt like tonight we need to pray for for our church is that anywhere in anybody's lives that there's in our in our, uh, any person that is a part of God's house here, God's house in Africa, that we just pray against those patterns and those strongholds and that bondage that's keeping them back. So let me pray, and then we'll just have worship music and spend some time in prayer together. God, I thank you for your word, and I thank you that where your spirit is, there is freedom. And so God, right now, in the name of Jesus, I just ask that you would come into this place and that your presence would fill this place, that as we spend time in your presence tonight, that even chains in our own lives would just begin to break, God, that where there's insecurity or where there's doubt or where there's sin or where there's fear or whatever's going on inside of even those of us here tonight, God, that you would begin to break that in us, God. But then I also pray that it wouldn't just be for us, God, but it would also be for our entire church, that whatever the enemies come in and tried to convince people to live in the pattern of this world, that it would be broken in the name of Jesus, Lord, that where the where spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And so we call in your Holy Spirit into this place, over this ministry, over here in Marion, over Africa, God, over every person that identifies as a part of God's house. We just ask tonight, Holy Spirit, that you would come and that the blood of Jesus would wash over every piece of bondage, every unhealthy pattern, and every stronghold where the enemy's trying to hold on to people or pull them back or convince them that you're not real or convince them that it's all fake or convince them that God's not still alive and he's not still doing the miracles and, or convince them that, that the things that are happening aren't really going to continue to happen, but it's just going to happen for a season and then it's all going to fall apart or, or convince them that their relationships will never get better or convince them that they'll never have enough money or they'll never see restoration in their family or whatever the enemy's coming 
and, 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 and convincing them to love the things of this world, which is that inner flesh that just says, I need what I need over and over and over. And they're trying so hard to hold on to themselves, God. I just break those things tonight in Jesus' name. I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would come over this church, over this ministry. Lord, as the pastor here, I just take authority over the presence of God in this house. And I just say, Jesus, you are welcome in this place, that the enemy does not have a place here. He does not get to take a pattern or put something on our people that every stronghold has to be broken because we plead the blood of Jesus over this house, over God's house, that every stronghold, every pattern, and every bit of bondage would be broken. And I pray tonight, God, that even those of us here would not leave here with anything left in us but your Holy Spirit and your presence, God, that you would come and you would fill us up and you would take all the junk out of us so that we can be filled with your joy and live free, the freedom that you died to give us, the freedom that comes in your presence. And I thank you tonight for your word that breaks chains even as it goes forth, God. I pray that you continue breaking chains in each of us and in this ministry. And I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would fall fresh on this place that lives would be changed, people would be healed, delivered, and set free by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's pray tonight. If you want prayer for anything, I'll be...